Hey, everybody, it's Rob Shear, the founder of Comfort Cases and the host of Fostering Change. You know, I am just so absolutely excited that we're doing the best of, and here we go again. You know, this actual interview I was so thrilled about because the person who I interviewed actually is a really good friend of mine, Michael Madero. He is actually the chief of staff of Child Help. I'm going to tell you, what an amazing organization. Most people do not even realize that this particular organization is one of the oldest nonprofits that are in the United States. You know, he didn't know it at the time, but Michael was, you know, actually going to be receiving an award that we were giving him, which is the Milton Hershey Award that we give out each year. And it was so exciting to be able to surprise him with that. So I hope each and every one of you enjoy this best of because this is definitely one of my best of. Have a great day. Well, you know, here we are again for another episode of Fostering Change. You know, I am telling you, as this year has gone by, by the way, it's gone by so fast, I cannot believe we're already all the way through March. But, you know, when I get to see my call sheet, when my producer sends over and I see who is going to be my guest for the month, I get excited about all the guests. I will tell you that. I truly do. But when I get to see guests that I know are my friends, it no longer becomes like an interview. It's more, you know, again, a conversation, you know, my next guest, I will tell you, I was so, so fortunate to meet him. Our mutual friend, Jen Lilly, actually introduced me to my next guest, and it was friendship right off the bat. And by the way, we're going to talk about why it became such a great friendship and how much we've actually done together and how quiet this man is about all the things that he does. But my next guest is actually the chief of staff for Child Help. Michael, welcome to Fostering Change. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's so great to see you. God, I miss your face. Oh, Michael, I miss you so much. Listen, I'm going to jump right in. I remember, you know, when I met Jen Lilly and she started talking about you and talking about child help, you know, for somebody who, you know, grew up in the system, I, I thought that I knew, you know, as much as I could, I was not familiar with child help. And even though you guys have been around since 1959, I really, really did some research on it after meeting you. And I'm going to tell you, your organization is truly what I consider not a game changer. I consider it a life changer, a life changer, you know. And so I would like for you to tell our listeners and viewers exactly what is child help. Well, thank you so much for that opportunity, Rob. And thank you for those kind words. So child help is one of the nation's largest and oldest national nonprofit organizations dedicated to the prevention, intervention, and treatment of child abuse. So that's a, a very an abbreviated way of saying that we are comprehensively looking at how do we address safety? How do we address bringing children into a better, healthier, safer, more encouraging and loving world? That's really what wow. child health is all about. So yeah, it was started 64 years ago by two Hollywood starlets, Sarah O'Mara and Yvonne Federson, who are still our acting president, CEO, chairman, and vice chairman of the board today. These women work a hundred hours a day. I mean, I mean, they, I don't know very many people that work as hard or as diligently as these two women, and they've done it for 64 years. They are incredible. But when they were, they started, they started on a USO tour following the Korean War. Upon their tenure over in not just uh, Japan, but also in Vietnam, they discovered a number of children that were considered throwaway children, children that were just cast out into the street as they were the results of American soldiers having relationships with women overseas and neither side wanting to take claim for these children. These children were throwaways. And that was just a term. That was just an image. That was just an experience that just broke Sarah and Yvonne to their core. And so while they were over there, they started multiple orphanages, multiple hospitals, multiple schools, all in partnership with our U.S. military, all designed to help these children move from such an unsafe, unhealthy environment to something that would give them encouragement, love, sustenance, and growth. They were the two women that orchestrated what I consider to be one of America's greatest successes, Operation Baby Lift, where they rescued yes. 3,500 of these children from the fall of Saigon and brought them to the United States where every single one of them had waiting adoptive families. Every single one. I actually have a couple of friends who actually were a part of that as babies. Oh my gosh. This last weekend, as we were having Drive the Dream, our Drive the Dream Gala, one of the children that were actually, if you see the history video of Child Help, You'll see babies in little boxes on that airplane. Right, yes. One of the kids was that was one of those babies. Oh my that was with us. And it's so great. And, and Rob, I love that. I love when you can 
meet an individual who can literally say, if it was not for your organization, I would not exist. Yeah. I yeah. wouldn't be here. If it was not for your organization and the impact. And now everything that has happened in my life, everything that I've contributed, everything that I've been a part of from that moment to today is a direct result of that impact and that action. And that is what makes Child Up so special. I mean, in 64 years, we've impacted the lives of more than 12 million children who have similar stories, similar experiences. And we've done that through the, the construction and the innovation of the Child Up National Child Abuse Hotline, which operates in- Yeah, every which by the way, I absolutely. And I, I want our listeners and viewers to know about this because I think it's so important. So many times, Michael, we have, we have you know, younger viewers and younger listeners who are in the system. Um, and as you know, in our foster care system, the abuse is rampant. And I love the fact that there is a number, which by the way, I didn't know about that as a young boy. And, you know, but I always remind people that there is a number because you can actually call somebody and they want to help you. They want yes. to help you. Yes. So our hotline and that number, Rob, is 1-800-4-A-CHILD. But that number serves every single state, Canada, Guam, all U.S. territories. Culturally, it serves up to 170 different languages through translators. But it's got the technology built in to allow any individual in crisis, child or adult, to immediately receive the resources they need upon that call. And thanks to a grant we received about four or five years ago, it now adds text and chat capabilities, which really was a game changer for us because so many youth today feel much more comfortable yes. texting and chatting than they do actually making a, a physical phone call. And so that hotline operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year by master or doctoral degree counselor. So when you're, you're calling, you're not calling just a phone operator, you're calling a counselor. And they're available 24 hours a day. And our approach to really breaking and interrupting the cycle of abuse starts there, but really is preceded by our prevention education curriculum, Child Help Speak Up, Be Safe. So Child Help Speak Up, Be Safe is the only evidence-based pre-K through 12th grade curriculum designed to educate students on not just the signs and symptoms of abuse, but what to do when they witness or experience abuse. And so that combination of educating children at the youngest age possible, keeping that education going all the way throughout their high school years and reinforcing every single year the availability of a professional counselor 24 hours a day for them, regardless of what they are experiencing or witnessing, is really that one-two combination that we want to put forward into more communities' awareness on how we can break the cycle of abuse. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you something. I agree 100% with you is the fact of it is called breaking the cycle, you know, because we've known this. It's been proven time and time again. Abusers are abused because the other person was abused. And it's a constant thing. And for some reason, we in our society and within our deep and threaded within our community, we tend to shame that. And I think that one of the things that, you know, one of the things I've noticed about child health, because I do follow you all on social media, Media, you know, you raise a ton of money all the time. And the sad part to me about that is that I feel like as our government, because it does make a stronger and healthier community when the abuse is not within it, by the way, it brings down our prison population. That's the first thing, which affects each and every one of us. It makes yeah. healthier humans. When you make a healthier child, you make a healthier human that becomes a healthier adult. You know, and I think that so many times that somewhere we're lacking that. But the thing that I want to ask you about is that, you know, and I've had this conversation with other people, but I really want your opinion because I truly do believe that we have gone so far to a point where we have separated our church and our state that we have forgotten truly what our base of foundation of community is. And I think that, you know, to me, I see that quite often. And, you know, no matter what happened in the Catholic Church or whatever, the fact that we have lost the base of what our community, do you feel that that brings so much that we could do more, but because we've lost that base, we're doing less? Absolutely. I think that is 100% accurate. You know, I know with, with Catholicism, obviously, it, it's got its dark history and, and, and presence with child abuse, uh, as does many other religions and many other cultures, et cetera. You know, it's not isolated to just that. But if we want to break it down to the bare tax, you know, anything that every single religion, everything, spiritual doctrine, um, every core value always starts with the same thing. And that's love. Even Christ himself said, that of all of my commandments, the greatest commandment of thee is love. And 
that's really, if we can get back to a community that really understood what love for one another means, healthy love, real love, pure love, not abusive love, not gross love, not harmful love, but not judgmental love. love. Not judgmental love. Exactly. Loving each other for who each other is and building each other up in their strengths and balancing each other out by understanding where you're strong may not be where I'm strong, but where I'm strong may not be where you're strong. Who you are is beautiful in and of itself, just as the beauty that I have in me is in beautiful and in that self. And bringing that to the forefront, what a much stronger, healthier, and better society and community we could be. You know, I wear, you know, I wear the shirt that I got from your operation, be a good human all the time. And I love it. And I intentionally wear it when I fly and I travel everywhere. I'm a, I live on airplanes. I wear that shirt. That is my travel shirt when I travel because I get asked about it all the time. And every single time I wear that shirt, people smile. I see people, they look at my face, they look down at my chest, they read the shirt, they smile. Historically. And some people will ask me, you know, oh, I love your shirt or what's your shirt about? And it brings me joy to be able to share the work that you do, the work that we do together and stuff like that. But the sentence alone, be a good human. Good human. Be, you know, I think right now about Sarah and Yvonne that they're actually smiling right now because, you know, the fact that you said all those words about love, I feel like, you know, in 1959, that was the only thing that they wanted to see happen. Yep. They saw children that were in need. Didn't matter what their color was. Didn't matter that they didn't look like the two of them. What yep. they saw was children in need and they needed to be loved. Listen up, everybody. We are talking with my friend, Michael. He is the chief of staff at Child Help. Listen, you can go to comfortcases.org and right at the very bottom, you can actually click on their, they have their logo there. They are partners with Comfort Cases. They have literally given us thousands among thousands among thousands among thousands of backpacks. We could never be able to do the mission that we've been doing. The 30,000 cases that went out last year with that out partnerships like Child Help. And you know what? We'll be right back. This episode of Fostering Change is sponsored by Comfort Cases, a national nonprofit that inspires our communities to bring hope and dignity to our youth that are in foster care. For just $10 a month, you can support the Comfort Case mission and help us eliminate trash bags for kids who are entering foster care. For every $10 that you give, Comfort Cases will give a Comfort XL to a child entering the system. Be part of the change. Visit comfortcases.org. Well, you know, as we were ending the last segment, you know, I was talking about partnerships and how important they are. You know, one of the things when Jen brought us all together, you know, Michael, it was so important for Jen Lilly to make sure that, you know, she brought nonprofits together to truly do what we all should be doing, which is working together. And I have to tell you, that is something that, you know, the three of us have truly done. We have continued that friendship, that growth, that bond, understanding that, you know, so many children, so many children in our country are going without so many children, you know, during the pandemic. And Michael, before we jump onto it, this is something that just popped in my mind. One of my biggest fears during the pandemic was, you know, Johnny, who was behind the screen and Zoom and wasn't able to be seen to have the black eye. And we all know that teachers are our frontline workers. We know that more children are reported for the abuse because of teachers making that phone call. What was child help doing? about that, knowing that our frontline workers weren't able to see these kids. That was actually one of the incredible things that we discovered about our hotline. So yes, during the pandemic, when children weren't at school, weren't even on recreational playgrounds or court fields, et cetera, all of the normal mandatory reporters that would be our advocates in our eyes and our ears were no longer with children. But it became that beauty of that one-two combination I talked about earlier, where around the country, in fact, um, the Wall Street Journal did a nice article about this around the country where every typical CPS or DCS hotline we're seeing significant decreases in calls from children and mandatory reporters the child up national child hotline saw double digit spikes month over month throughout the pandemic and that was because more children were leveraging that text and chat capability with our hotline counselors that they were now feeling the need for as they were trapped at home with their abusers the knowledge that they gained from um, their prevention education efforts before the pandemic led to the success of their ability to reach out for help during 
the pandemic. And since then, we have seen things kind of plateau a bit right. where numbers were prior to the pandemic starting. But we were so grateful for the ability for the pandemic to show us how text and chat is really vital for children to be able to reach out when they are not in an environment where they feel safe to do so or where there's not a mandatory reporter there to help them, such as in school or on an athletic field. Yeah, you know, and I have to tell you, you know, as you were saying that about, you know, kids, whether they're calling 911 or they're going, I feel like there is a, a space with child help. Number one, just think of the name of it, child help, that there is a safety net for these kids that they truly feel, you know what, I'm going to call them. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, I mean, come on, you and I read the paper every single day. We're not going to sit here and say, not every police officer is bad, but they definitely right. have gotten some bad raps. We know that. We know, you know, kids who have complained to social workers have you know what's happened is that their abuser have been told and so they've been abused twice as hard because nobody wants to believe them but what i see with child help is the fact that it's a safe place for them to text safe place for them to call safe place for them to chat and somebody that's truly going to help them and help them guide through that and and i'm i'm glad you know i'm not glad to hear that the numbers doubled but what i'm happy to hear though is that these kids had somewhere to call, that these kids Absolutely. had somebody to text, that these kids actually, because again, as I said, you make a healthier child, you make a healthier adult. You know, the things that, you know, I, I absolutely love is I, I'm a true believer in community. I think community is not our zip code. It's our human race. I think that each and every one of us should be invested in our community. You know, it's the reason why I brought up the thing about church, because, you know, as a, as a man of faith and you know, who raised my children with faith, I truly remind my minister and, and those who go to our church all the time is that our one job is here is to serve. And that's something that we all need to know. How could somebody actually serve when it comes to child help? Great question. I appreciate that. You know, we were uh, exiting in the last segment talking about love. And, and I love that because even above every, every single child help facility, the words above the doors all read, all who enter here will find love. That, that really is the core of who we are. And that's really what I would encourage your listeners to bring into their community is love. Through child help, it's really through awareness. I mean, yes, we love the donations. We need the financial resources and support just like every nonprofit. So that's the cleanest way to help involve. But our objective is to bring that one-two combination I was talking about earlier into every community. And it starts with awareness. So it starts with what can you do to make your school, the school where your children go to, or the school where your nephews or your nieces go to, aware of prevention education? And do they have prevention education? Now, obviously, you know, we've got the only evidence one pre-K through 12th grade, but there's other, you know, there's other prevention education efforts out there. I'm more concerned with children understanding the values that are depicted in prevention education curriculum, be it a child help, speak up, be safe for another. But how could we bring prevention into our communities more? What can you do? Can you introduce the idea of prevention to your church, to your school? We've got a Courage First hotline, which we just launched this year, which is designed specifically for athletes who um, find themselves in abusive situations. So what are the resources that child help has to offer that you can help us bring awareness of into your community? Again, our hotline, our curriculum serves every single community, has the capability of every single community in this country can be served by those two programs, but not every community knows about them. Right. Child Up only has brick mortar operations in four states, California, Arizona, Tennessee, and Virginia. That means for the rest of the country, there's not a brick mortar operation that's going to be that constant reminder to them. I've seen that building. I've seen that billboard. I've seen the news interview them, whatever the case may be. That's what you can do. You can help bring awareness of how do I bring more understanding that these services exist, even though there may not be a brick mortar presence? That is one, one of the greatest ways that people can bring child up into their community. I love that. I absolutely love that because it goes back to the fact that if you actually educate your community of a problem, and by the way, there's not a community out there, those who are listening and watching, I, so you can send me the emails, I get them all the time, my, I've got tough skin. There's not a community out there, not one community out there that could not use this. Because exactly. 
every single community, there is some line of abuse that is happening and we have got to stop pretending like it doesn't. And this is, you know, for me as a public speaker, I was actually speaking at an elementary school last week and the principal had a meeting with me prior like telling me what I was allowed to say and what I was not allowed to say. And I will have to tell you, I was very, I didn't feel comfortable about that. And then the reason I didn't feel comfortable about it is because I do not care what age you are, you must feel safe. And the yep. only way you feel safe is by having people talk. Yep. You know, I agree. I'm going to, I'll share a very quick example with you that, that I think talks to that a bit in a positive way, but it felt negative in the beginning. I had our prevention education curriculum being taught in a very affluent community in Northern California. And a child disclosed to an adult that they felt they had been exposed to pornography. And that administration contacted the parents and the parents were outraged, just outraged. They were embarrassed. They couldn't believe they received that kind of a call. They were so furious that they actually, and they were significant supporters of the school financially, they had actually asked the school to stop teaching the prevention curriculum because of their embarrassment. The school called me and we had a conversation and I asked them what exactly transpired. And, and to keep the story short, what ended up happening was the child was became aware, he was in third grade, he'd become aware of pornography in the sense that sometimes there are illustrations in print and online that depict the male and the female body in inappropriate ways. That is what was initially taught to the child. And sometimes that is that is wrong. When he came home, he had found an art deco book that was in their living room on the coffee table that had images of nude statues. His connection of those two things is what motivated him to say something. Now, I flew out to Northern California to meet with this family and to meet with this school in particular because I wanted to share with them the value of what happened. The value was your child what was beginning to connect is what I'm seeing appropriate or not and had a question. He didn't make an accusation. He had a question and he felt the strength and the comfort to be able to ask that question in a way to get an honest answer and response and bring you all together to say, is this appropriate or is that inappropriate? And that is exactly what we want our youth to be doing more of asking questions, not accusations, not judgment. It's a question is, is this cool? Is it okay that I see this? Is it okay that I'm exposed to that? And it's your right as parents to have those conversations with your children, this is appropriate because this is art. This is not depicted in a way that is harmful for the subjects that are in this or for the topic, whereas something else may be inappropriate and we'll continue to have those exploratory conversations. As a result of that, not only did the school re-up on the prevention curriculum, but the entire district ended up Good. adopting the curriculum. As a, But that's what I'm talking about. Have conversations. We cannot yes. let our children be educated on what is appropriate and inappropriate as it relates to intimacy, as it relates to connections between a man and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman, et cetera, by online. You go online and you expect your children to learn through online resources. They're going to learn some things that is not what you want them to exactly. learn. Exactly. I agree with you. Let me tell you, I took my kids last year to Italy. We were going into some museums and we had the conversation with two of our boys because we needed to let them know age appropriate, what they were getting ready to see. I mean, they were to see the statue of David and all of these right. things. And I remember my youngest son at the time, he was like 12 or, you know, and he says to me, he says, dad, he says, this is just art, you know? And I said, you know why you say that is because you're able to have a conversation with your father, yes. you know, and you're yes. right about that. Michael, it starts with the conversation, not the accusation, yes. the conversation, because the moment a child doesn't feel safe that they can have that conversation with somebody, the moment they think that something is wrong, you know? Yes. And that, is, yep, something is wrong. Listen up, everybody. The organization is called Child Help. It's going to be a link right here on the show. Again, I mean, again, time just flies by when you're talking to friends. And I will tell you, if you do anything, do anything. You know, I ask of this. Go to Child Help. Truly see what they're doing. Do exactly what my friend Michael said. You know, talk about it with your church, your synagogue, your temples, your mosses. Talk about it within your school districts. You know, those who sit on the school board, this is something we need to be talking about. Because God, by the way, it's not going away. Right. It's not going away. And what we can do is we can actually start making a new generation, a new generation that is not scared to ask the questions. Because my generation, we didn't ask it. 
We didn't talk about it. Just the other night, Michael, my husband and I were sitting in town with our two of our sons and, you know, I have five kids and there was this TV show on and I laughed and said, you know, when I was a little boy, you couldn't even show a man and a woman in the same bed. You know, you, and if you did, one of them had to have their foot on the ground. And yeah. so, and you didn't talk about it either, by the way. You didn't yeah. go to your parents and ask questions like that. I want a generation where it's okay to talk about healthy conversations. So listen, Michael, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you for all the backpacks. You know, you, like I said, child help, we would have never made our goal if it wasn't for you. So thank you for your love. Next time you see Sarah and Yvonne, give them my love and tell them- Thank you for just showing us all how we truly should truly love. Take care, everybody. Thank you. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for listening or watching the latest episode of Fostering Change. All of us on our team hope that you've learned something new today and have been inspired to be a good human. Now, just a reminder that you can always find Fostering Change on your favorite channels on Google, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and others including, of course, comfortcases.org. I want to give a big thank you to all of you for joining us each and every week. And a reminder that if you have a suggestion for a guest, or maybe you might have a question about today's podcast, or are interested in becoming a sponsor of Fostering Change, please don't hesitate to email me personally at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Now, that's it for now. Thanks again, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Take care.